Okay, cool. Berto, first of all, how are you, mate? Hey, how's it going, man? Happy New Year, everyone. Yeah, Happy New Year to you as well, my friend. So uh, welcome to the Cyber Security Recruiter podcast uh, live edition. I hope everyone's okay. I hope everyone had a nice break over the holidays. Today, I'm joined by Alberto Rodriguez. I'm just going to do Alberto a bit of an intro for everyone that, that's listening. Originally started out in the U.S. Army. He was a cyber operations officer. Uh, then Alberto, back in uh, January 2020, moved on to uh, Compute Quip Cybersecurity, where he was a SOC and red team lead. He then moved on to 6Gen, where he was a director and red team operator. Alberto then spent some time at PayPal. Uh, originally, he started there as a senior security engineer, and then he was a staff security engineer. And right now, Alberto is at GuidePoint Security, and he is the management security consultant, threat and attack simulation. Welcome to the show, my friend. And was your intro okay? Did I, did I get everything right? Did I miss anything? Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Yeah, all, all as well. The the long story short of that is it's on government time and just really been doing consulting ever since leaving the service. So yeah, excited to be here and thanks for the intro. Yeah, brilliant, my friend. And, and thanks for coming on. And by the way, for everyone listening, me and Alberto are going to give you the best show possible. It is live. So I think most lives I've done, something's gone wrong at some point. We've either had someone's dog barking in the background or ambulances or police cars going past or so, something's always gone wrong on a live. So me and Albert will give you our best bet possible, but I can't make uh, promises that it will be seamless because it, because it is live. I'm going to dive straight into it, Alberto. What trait do you believe these days make up a highly successful offensive security engineer in today's market? All right. Yeah. We're jumping into the deep end. Yeah. So I, I would say there's a couple of things and this isn't just offensive security specific. I would say this applies to any technology or information security professional, anyone listening within that spectrum. Mm -hmm. I think what makes somebody highly successful for starters is being able to adapt quickly. And what I mean by that is our industry changes so much one day. There's a specific tactic that's just really advantageous to you as a red teamer and things are going well. You flip on the channel, you go to Twitter, Mastodon, et cetera, or X, and that is no longer viable or that has been patched. And the same applies when you're a blue teamer. On a Thursday, you're hanging out, you're going through your day-to-day -day tasks. Next thing, Friday morning, there is a new CVE and it turns out you're environment is going to be susceptible to that CVE. So you have to react very quickly. So that I would say that's bullet number one there. Be very highly adaptable. The, the second thing is I would say be a very hungry and curious individual. Th this industry is so deep and so wide that uh, unless you enjoy, you know, the game, if you will, of being challenged, of learning something new every day. I think it makes it very difficult to say successful. And I'll be the first to say there are times where just like everybody else who has a different job, there are times where you're just not feeling it, right? Unfortunately, when those times come, you get left behind a little bit. So again, being able to stay hungry and push past some of the challenges that we overcome, I think it's certainly a very highly successful kind of trait for anyone to have. And then more offensive security specific. Now, anyone who's been the red or bleeds red on the side of the house, I think in order, and this will be controversial, but bear, bear with me here. I think in today's market, you must have, again, highly successful was the criteria you, you post here. Just keeping that in mind. In today's market, I think automation and programming are just such a necessity. 
if you're on the offensive security side, you have to be able to build infrastructure, build payloads, do reconnaissance at scale. All of that takes code. All of that takes programming. All of that takes automation. So again, if we're going with highly successful offensive security practitioner, I would highly recommend you to get some programming automation skills, be a little bit of the DevOps side, a little bit of the software engineering side. I'm not suggesting you should be a software engineer by any means, but again, some programming and automation skills will really serve you for the long haul. Yeah, brilliant, Alberto. Thanks for that. And there's some really good things there. So just to just unpack that and just 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 reiterate some points there for the listeners. And by the way, mega audience, like over 200 people. But this is the biggest audience we've had so far on a LinkedIn Live. So I'm really happy. And yeah, this is great. So adaptable for guys and girls listening. This is applicable whether you're on the blue team or the red team. So you could be in an instant response or you could be a hacker or you could be working in a cloud environment, whatever it might be. InfoSec moves quick, prepared to be three-dimensional and adapt and so on and so forth. Hungry and curious. Yeah, couldn't agree more, Alberto. Ted Harrington, who'd done a TED Talk hacking, mentioned that word you did, which was curious. So yeah, could uh, again, mate, well, good, good, good point. And you also mentioned just being hungry and, and stuff like that. Automation was something you mentioned. Programming was another thing mentioned. I think, you know, Never before have there been so many learning resources online. And I know we're going to come on a little bit later in this show about the best learning resources out there and where to, where to point and aim your attention. But so, some really good points. And Alberto, just a quick one there. You mentioned if you're not feeling it, it can be frustrating. And I'm motivated, I'm hungry, and I'm the first to admit, like you did, my friend, is it's hard to be hungry all the time. But have you got any kind of tips for, for staying hungry or if you're not feeling completely on on point, any advice for the listeners there at all? Or? Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I think this is one of those topics that we don't talk about enough in our industry. But the reality is security is difficult. It's a challenging career field, but it's not impossible. Every, everyone can do it if you put your mind to it. I truly believe that. And part of that is knowing yourself. Part of that is having escapes outside of technology. I play basketball. I do jujitsu. I have family that I love to spend time with. I go out to restaurants. We're food, fooders, as they say here in the States, where we like to go to restaurants and eat a ton of food in different places. Find something that allows you to escape. Find something that allows you to like refresh the browser, if you will, and just get your mind off of technology. Get your mind off of the problem. Clear your head and then come back and, you know, tackle whatever challenge you need to be. So... In summary, I think just having outlets outside of technology, outside of a computer really help. Yeah, definitely. And again, I couldn't agree more. Have it giving your mind that time to decompress. Your brain and your mind is like any other muscle. It needs to rest, to grow, to develop, to stay sharp. So yeah, ha having something to switch the attention definitely with, with again, in security, it can get pretty, uh, pretty hot and intense at times. So yeah, I think that's, I think that's vital. And Alberto, as I move on to the next question, we've mentioned how fast things move, being adaptable, learning new things. With that in mind, it's obviously going to be really beneficial for the listeners to understand, grasp and learn optimal and, and, and helpful learning techniques. What learning techniques, I know you've, um, this is pretty relevant to, to your background as well. What, what learning techniques would you advise and you say are going to be most helpful for the listeners to maximize their career growth and progression within security? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll give this response, but before I give this response, I'll preface this with, you know, I, I recently became an educator as of three, four years where I started teaching adults security. Okay. With that said, prior to me teaching, I went through the grind or the struggle as everybody else on the call is, which is learning a career field. And for me, it was really two career fields. For me, it was cybersecurity slash IT, if you will, but also the profession of arms, which is warfare, because I was an officer in the military. So with that said, I've, in my eyes, I've narrowed down getting good and learning security to sort of three fundamental things that everyone should be aware of, okay? First is 
hands-on work. All right, security is a hands-on tradecraft. It's a hands-on skill, okay? Just like welding or plumbing. In order for you to understand some of these concepts, you have to get hands-on. What that means is home labs, virtual machines, containers, cloud infrastructure, spinning up Kali and hacking at something, spinning up security onion and detecting something. You have to get hands-on in order for your brain to absorb what it is that you're trying to learn. The second thing is internal documentation, okay? I, I don't know how true this is, but I've heard that if you write something down, you'll memorize it more than if you just read about it. And if you hear about it and you write it down, you memorize it more than if you only read about it. So the more you expose your brain to a respective topic, the more likely you are to retain that information. So what I recommend everyone is to have your own internal documentation of what you are learning. As you go through YouTube, blog posts, X, here on LinkedIn, GitHub repos, et cetera, there's a plethora of information out there and it's all very valuable, but it's important for you to document your own learning phases and document the things that you're doing. So that way it retains, it retains your brain a little better than just reading about it or just watching a YouTube video about it. Okay. So having that second factor of remembering something, I think is the second benefit or the second thing I'd recommend in order for you to learn in this mm -hmm. career field. And then the last thing that I would tell you is, don't, don't know how to really verbalize this one, but I personally call it the squirrel effect. Okay. You're, sometimes there's so much information out there that your mind will squirrel to other things that are not really important to what you're actively learning. I mean, what I mean by squirreling is really an analogy here in the States, but essentially looking the other way, right? There's a new shiny thing over there flashing and your attention for what you're currently learning goes in a different direction. And a lot of people that are new to the industry and even mid-level individuals, I see they're doing something, they're working towards a specific goal. And then all of a sudden they find some YouTube video or some LinkedIn post and they start going in that direction. But if you keep splitting your path multiple times, multiple days throughout multiple weeks, you're never really going to achieve anything. You're just moving all over the place. Okay. Not saying don't explore all the things. What I'm trying to say is try to stay focused on the topic that you're learning and try to keep a nice, well-documented calendar or agenda for yourself on your learning style and the learning content that you're presenting to your brain. So again, just three things really. One, make sure you get as much hands-on as work as possible. Two, it doesn't matter if you're reading about something, write it down, get your own notes with your own wording, because that's gonna help you remember more topics than just reading them. And then three, try to avoid the distractions with squirreling to different hot topics or things that may come up in your, your social media feeds and things of that nature. Brilliant. Alberto, that was great, mate. Thanks. And um, I'm just going to pick up on a few points here, but the writing down thing, I, I, I can say personally, that is massive. Know when you've got a lot on and there's a million and one distractions on the internet and so on and so forth. It's very easy to feel overwhelmed and stressed. And even as far as to go to, to write things down neatly and even do diagrams and stuff like that, some people that might sound a bit over the top, but I know firsthand it, it it declutters the mind. It provides additional clarity around your learnings and your direction and where you're going. And it just, I find personally, it relieves uh, a lot of stress. I know a lot of people in the industry have ADHD and different things like that. And I know that writing stuff down, just it declutters the mind and it just really helps you move forward in the in the right direction. Do you find that as well, Alberto, when you're writing stuff down, it just really clears things up for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like a long-term investment, right? If you write it down now, you're more likely to remember that respective topic, one. And two, you're at the same time, you're going to start practicing your writing abilities and practicing your documenting abilities. Because as security professionals, we write reports all the time. 
And most of the time, those reports are external facing, meaning they go to somebody outside of your team. But the other flip side of that is practicing just documentation overall for your internal team. Okay, so you're not only writing things for your clients, but you're also writing things for your own team. And that goes into multiplying the capabilities of the team that you work in, which ultimately leads to better work-life balance, people helping you out as well, people thinking you're a better partner or a better coworker because you actually die decent documentation. You don't want to show up to a job and say, yeah, this is my first time ever documenting anything. That's probably the wrong answer. So might as well, might as well start it now and have multiple benefits go with it. No, definitely, my friend. Thanks for that. And yeah, if you, and like you say, it's a long-term investment. Essentially, if you're writing stuff down, that becomes your IP, your intellectual property, and you've got that forever. And yeah, it's definitely an investment. A couple of other things for everyone listening, get hands-on keyboard. Definitely the best way to learn. A home lab, very helpful. Obviously, as we've said, writing, writing stuff down uh, and avoid spreading yourself too thin and, and diluting that uh, learning journey too much. Have some specific things that um, are high on the priority list that, that, that remain central and, and, and then focus. Yeah, thanks for that, my friend. But so on, the, on the home lab, any tips there for, for getting a home lab stood up quickly and getting some benefits there, bro? Sure. Yeah. This is always such a hot topic in security because it could go so many different ways. The first tip is just start it. Just don't think about it too much because over time you will want to change your home lab. It's inevitable. It doesn't matter if you're at level one or level 1000. Okay. Everybody that I know in security, including myself is never happy with their home lab and always wants to change it. So just start something, right? Acquire some hardware somewhere, go to swap shops, go to the Goodwill, get some hardware, start building virtual machines, start Googling home labs, topics and things of that nature, and then just get building. It's always a great place to start with an Active Directory environment, a Cali box, and then just going at it. Security Onion is an excellent product as well for more of the blue side of the house. The SANS SIFT workstation, which is like their SANS version of a digital forensics workstation. They have that virtual machine out there in the wild as well. The commando VM for a Windows offensive machine, like all the resources are out there. You just got to go and get them. So I would just say start it as soon as possible because you're never going to be happy with it. And as you progress through this industry, you'll continue to want to change it. It's inevitable. It's part of the game. So no worries there. Yeah, cool. Listen, that ties in with the uh, prepare to be adaptable piece. <laughs> Things are changing. Yeah, absolutely. And about, yeah. Yeah, by the way, just on, on the kind of your, your attention getting diverted, I, I just think that's something that's just so prevalent in a modern day society. Like, I know I'm sure you're getting hit up probably probably by recruiters all day long, but by all sorts of people selling you this, that, and everything. I get hit up by vendors selling different rec tech technology for, for recruiters. And I think it's quite easy to create cre create a habit in the sense that you just end up getting di diverted off to everything and, and you get nothing done. I think sometimes having that, real intensity and that, that blinkered approach, even for a couple of hours a day, you can just get so much done, especially when it comes to, to learning. I think it's about creating solid habits as well around that, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it all goes, it all goes down to self-discipline, unfortunately, which is difficult to look at yourself in the mirror and ask the question, am I disciplined enough? Am I focused enough to do what I have to do? Am I on my phone half the day at work or am I putting my phone in a different room so I could focus at work? Am I going one hour at a time and taking 10 minute breaks or am I just going with the flow and having no actual agenda throughout my day? So it goes, it all goes down to self-discipline. I think most adults, at least those that I interact with, I think we all know what the right answer is, but we also know what the wrong answer is. And sometimes we choose the wrong. So staying focused is super important, especially because of our industry so like remote friendly or technology friendly that we can go down the Twitter rabbit hole for 30 minutes or read a blog post and then start clicking on all the links within that and spend an hour and a half there. So just staying focused, I think, goes a long way. And the sooner you learn that skill, the more it's going to, you know, improve your efficiency long term. Yeah, definitely, my friend. As a comment to the next question, there's... I mentioned the age of the internet earlier, and we're all very luckily, lucky and privileged to have all these learning resources. 
I think one of the issues is is there's that much around. It can be so sometimes it, you can find yourself procrastinating over over what to look at. I know from conversations I've had, I know that your learning blog is good. I know it's been verified by some seriously legit people within our industry. Can you tell us more about your learning blog and how that will help the listeners uh, progress, buddy? Yeah, absolutely. So the blog is blog.badsectorlabs.com. And this was actually started by a friend of mine, Eric Hunstead, who is wicked good hacker, wicked good employee overall, just very wise and seasoned sort of cybersecurity professional and leader. Uh, but Eric started it many moons ago. And I think probably like a year or a year or so ago, I started helping him with the blog. And part of our blog and why I think that's a great resource for the industry is everything that we post is manually curated by either him or me. Okay. So there's a lot of information out there on the internet, uh, a lot of different blogs, a lot of different links with like bleeping computer and a bunch of different resources. We like to go through each one, click on them. And if we feel like it's valuable for work, we put it on the blog. That, that's really it. There's no other magic sauce than that. It's manually curated by us. We determine whether it's going to be valuable for our day-to-day -day jobs or not. And if it is, we put it on the blog. The blog will include like recent tools that are released. It'll include different sort of walkthroughs or trade craft that's being released. I mean, we usually publish it every week or at most every two weeks or something like that. So yeah, feel free to check it out. Again, it's blog.batsectorlabs.com and it's an excellent research. There's others like it. But we, no bias here, but we like ours a little better just because it doesn't have some of the noise from the other places. And yeah, we track close to 500 different data sources and then we pick out the few and publish it there. Wicked, mate. Thanks for that. And yeah, that, that, that is nice to know because everything's been vetted by yourself. Everything on there is worthwhile and, and, and worth, your, worth, worth your time. What we'll do as well for everyone listening, by the way, Manu and, and Fossil, thanks for, for, your, for your questions. We are going to come to you at the end. I really like it when, when these lives get interactive. So when we get to the end, we'll save some time and we'll definitely do a, a Q&A. Joel, thanks, my mate, for asking a question. We'll definitely come to you at the end. Breaking in, Alberto, like it's, it's fierce at that junior end of the market. It's hard to break in. Obviously, at the senior end, it becomes much more candidate-led, but at the, at the junior end, it's very client-led and, and very tough for people to break in. The question is, the question is, mate, how did how did you first break in? What's the best way to break in? And any advice, tips, or hints for the listeners listening now and the future listeners that will be listening on Spotify and podcast uh, addicts and Apple Pods and and places like that? Any tips for breaking in, mate? And if you've got a story on how you did that, would be that would be cool as well. Sure. Yeah. My, my story isn't as groundbreaking, to be quite honest. I was traditional in the sense that I did an undergraduate degree in technology, and then I joined the military and the military kind of made me a security professional. A bit of a cheat code there. If anyone's listening with government ties, the government's a great place to do security from the sense that it, it'll provide a ton of training, a ton of resources, ton of experience. So it's a bit of a cheat code to get started. For those that are going outside the government route, here's what I usually recommend. And this is coming from being a professor, helping my students land their first job, and just talking with a lot of junior and people trying to break into the industry. The first thing I'll mention is a lot of people want to land that I'm a red team or a pen tester or I'm a SOC analyst type of role when they first start. And the probability of that, it's, it's smaller than you probably think. So setting some expectations for yourself, it would be the first thing I'd recommend. Those jobs, unfortunately, the, the funnel is very small at the entry level, and then it gets bigger, like the mid to senior level of security. So I would always recommend folks explore IT and explore GRC. So what I mean by that is there's a lot of different information technology job roles that just require people to have technical aptitude. They require people to understand computers, understand the common operating systems, networking, et cetera, and do that first go around in just a technology work role. Similarly goes for GRC. GRC is more of like the compliance, auditing sort of side of the house, which I personally haven't touched. 
but some of my students have had some pretty good luck in landing GRC roles simply because they're not as you know popular as the other ones. So the, the competition is a little bit less. The, the other thing I'll mention is networking is probably going to be a great factor into landing your first job. Networking, for, for anyone who's not familiar, is simply making friends and making professional connections. You can do that via LinkedIn, but you can also do that through your local meetups, depending on where you live. There's usually some type of technology event throughout the year that could occur. Take a look at conferences, take a look at just meetup events in your area. That's going to be a, a great place for you to meet individuals that are probably working in the industry that are more likely to refer you to a job. And then the last thing I'll mention with breaking in is what makes you different than everybody else? There's a ton of people out there, especially in the U.S. I'm not too familiar with the outside markets of the U.S., but in the U.S. specifically, there's a ton of folks out there with their bachelor's degree, like a certification here and there, and they're just expecting to get that first job. So out of all of you that have the same requirements, what's going to make you different? What's going to make you stand out, right? Because if the pool is 200 and I can only hire one, you can see how your degree and your cert just because everybody else has the same, makes you look a little less competitive. Some of the things I would recommend for the, that industry is home lab, building a home lab, building a blog, having a GitHub repository with just some fundamental projects in there. I think those three specifically will help you stand out. And then don't be afraid to go for some of the more non-traditional certifications. And we could probably get into some cert stuff here at the end. But there's just a million and one ways to showcase knowledge and to showcase skill outside of a degree or a certification that you want to cover as many boxes as possible to be competitive. That was probably quite a bit, but there's just, there's so much, you know, out there to break it into security overall. Uh, that could be a whole conversation on its own. No, wicked, Alberto, mate. That was a, that was a mega answer. And, and thanks again. Thanks again, buddy. And I think a massive thing you said there as well is, like, like I say, your ideal job doesn't have to be your first job. I, I see it all the time. People trying to be a hacker from the word go or, or, or like I say, get into, I think you mentioned SOC or like the cloud security engineer. You know, these are, wherever you are in the world, these are, these are serious, serious jobs, dream jobs. Like it's, it's pretty tricky to, to just land, uh, land at the very upper echelon of the security jobs market. So yeah, I, th I think that's great advice. And also I think that, getting yourself on the payroll, getting cracking. It means you can afford to go to events. It means you can afford to educate yourself, get certifications and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think that's massive, my friend. And and yeah, we can definitely have a little chat about about, about certs at the end. And, and by the way, I, I, you said about, I know in America, it's this case, it's the same all over the world, Alberto. At the, at the junior end, certain job roles are very tricky to break in on. We did a whole episode on breaking in via grc so if everyone goes to the cybersecurity recruiter youtube channel you'll be able to to find that episode and and, and that was um that, that that was definitely helpful so i've heard that opinion mirrored across multiple episodes thanks again alberto on i just want to ask you about sticking with the theme of learning techniques progression career growth i just want to ask you about what you feel the importance of getting a mentor is and how, as a listener, I should go about acquiring a, a mentor? Ooh, yeah, that's a tough one. Obviously, having mentors is, I don't want to say it's like a requirement, but it, it's so valuable to you as an individual. Like, I have mentors from a cybersecurity professional standpoint. I have mentors for, like, my side hustle in real estate investing. I have mentors for just kind of like life, like some ex-professors of mine. and people that I look up to from just like being a father and, and, and being a provider and things of that nature. Mentorship is very valuable. With that said, getting a mentor in security is, I don't want to say it's difficult, but it's, it's a bit different than the other verticals that I talked about. Because a lot of the time, especially people that I mentor, I want to mentor somebody who's a specific way. And I think every mentor has their own version of a mentee, somebody that they're, they would be willing to invest time and effort into investing into that person. So it's like this relationship that has to really, it has to really 
flow well together. Okay. It has to be a relationship that kind of goes both ways. I think one of the best ways to identify these mentors is through just natural relationship building. Don't look for a mentor just to call them a mentor, if you will. Don't hit up people randomly on LinkedIn and say, hey, can you be my mentor? Yeah, sure, you can do that and you might stick one, but that's just not the way to go about getting a mentor. I think the, the best way to get a mentor is to network with individuals overall. And then eventually you guys will match in something maybe outside of security. But just to give you an example, I play basketball. I was playing with a friend of mine. My friend has a guy who plays basketball as well, and he's looking at getting into security. So not only did we connect on the fact that we can talk about basketball in the NBA, go Heat, Miami Heat, but you can also break into, okay, yeah, let's talk about some more work-related stuff, mentorship-related stuff. I Again, network with people. You'll eventually find commonalities outside of technology. I think that's a natural flow into mentorship, and that probably will make people invest in you a little bit more than try to find like a legitimate mentor or somebody that's like influencing on the internet that you think is really knowledgeable and may have your best interests at heart, but the reality is that they don't. So just be careful with some of the internet stuff. A lot of people making a lot of money from sponsorships out there. Just do your due diligence. And at the end of the day, the human factor is super important. You know, this applies to security. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely, my friend. And yeah, so you've got to build a relationship. If it, if it's some form of cold outreach, it's it's not going to get a lot of traction. At, certainly at first, because it because by nature it, it it is cold. It needs to be uh, more of a deeper relationship. And yeah, I think you mentioned two way or mutually beneficial. It's got to. It can't just be all take. Or there's going to be a, a lifespan on on that kind of relationship for for obvious reasons. So thanks again, mate. Online learning resources. I know uh, from offline conversations we, we've had, my friend, you really favor favor social and, and blog posts and YouTube. So I won't I, I won't ask you I won't ask you about books. I'll ask you about the online learning resources that you tap into that have been most helpful to you that could also help the listeners, mate. Sure. Yeah. For for me, I try to follow a very simple approach to staying up to date and to learning simply because time is limited. I have a family, I have extracurriculars. And at the end of the day, like I mentioned, balancing security with learning is, is very important in the long term. With that said, I'm a big learner or I get a lot of my content from social media, GitHub repositories and blog posts. Okay. So I follow industry security people. Some are in the U.S., others are in France, others are in the Middle East. Like, it just depends. People are just all over the place. Some people I know their names, other people I just know whatever handle they use on social media. So being able to build your content, whether it's on Twitter, on LinkedIn, et cetera, build content with like reputable individuals that actually do the cybers, if you will. Sometimes you'll come across content and it's just copy pasted from somewhere else. And you can find the fact that they just copy paste it. Other times it's very low level and detailed, which is the kind of content that I like to digest. So it, it really depends on you, but I would say build the content around the platforms that you enjoy, around the people that you actually want to learn from. And then one of the last resources I'll use is YouTube. And YouTube for me is more of a lazy learning platform for me individually. If there's something that I just you know, I don't want to go through and Google my life away or click through a bunch of resources to get the gist of it. I'll listen to a 20 minute, 30 minute YouTube, you know, video on a specific topic. And usually those blog, those YouTube channels are from, again, people that I've been listening to for a while that I know they're going to give me a good technical sound answer. And if they don't know something, they're going to say, hey, I'm not too familiar with this, but feel free to research it on your own. I think honesty is so you know, important um, in this industry, especially from those that you're digesting information from. I don't necessarily want to give like specific ones because I could probably sit here all day and go through my personal links on where I go. But if you follow the blog that I, that I work on, again, blog.batsectorlabs.com, that'll have some of those resources there. For YouTube, there's some good ones out there like John Hammond, you know, he, he puts out really good stuff. 
Ipsec, he's probably the GOAT. If you're into Hack the Box and things of that nature, Ipsec has the best YouTube videos, in my opinion out there. Those are probably the two individual ones that I'll mention because I know for a fact you're going to get uh, pretty good content out of them. Uh, yeah, I would say that's about it. And yeah, I, like you mentioned, I don't read books. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine, mate. It's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, no. And, and by the way, for everyone listening, this this live episode will go out. And when it does in the show notes, we'll have Alberto's blog in there. So everyone will be able to, to access it easily. I'm sure. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll do a post about it this uh, this evening, Alberto, I've uh, dropped the last couple of last 40 hours. I've dropped the, the ratio down on the posting. So you've inspired me to post about your blog, mate. So that can be uh, that can be this evening's um, LinkedIn content for me. And uh, earlier on, mate, you, you mentioned about standing out when you're applying. And I just want to just reapproach that because I know how tough it is at the junior end of the market. And you mentioned about a lot of people will have various education, various qualifications, various certifications. And I think you said was you talked about a home loan, you talked about GitHub repos, you talked about branding, and essentially it all encompasses personal brand and all ties in. You know, if you're posting about your wins, your success, you're building your YouTube channel, you're building your LinkedIn page, you're documenting your learnings, so it's reinforcing your learning. It's almost like a version of writing your stuff down. You're enhancing your own learning experience. You're building your personal brand, and some of this stuff is long term, but it's really beneficial and i think this stuff is going to become more and more prevalent and important with every day week month the year that passes i just wanted to reiterate a few good points that i think you made there mate and just really hone in on that for the for the listeners as we come towards the end now mate i just want to i do want to save a little bit of time at the end for the questions i just wanted to ask you certifications what do you think is getting the most bang for your buck any any thoughts hints tips for the listeners that's going to really benefit their career progression yeah, let's see. Obviously, shoot a quick disclaimer. I don't work for any of the certification vendors. I don't particularly, I don't know, prefer one versus the other or anything like that. Yeah, just want to preface that. In terms of certifications, obviously, like when you, if you spend 15 to 20 minutes Googling, you'll probably come across some of the popular ones. You know, the CompTIA's, Offensive Security, maybe ISC Squared, maybe SANS maybe e-learning security. So there's a lot of them out there, CEH, et cetera. So my, here's my two cents on certifications. Again, probably controversial topic overall, but it's a podcast, so what the heck. The reality is people have to understand that certifications are not a silver bullet into landing you a job or getting you that interview, if you will. And if we take one quick step back, you know, your resume for anyone in the audience, your resume's job is just to get you a phone call. Okay. It's like that initial, wow, this looks pretty good. Okay. Let's talk to this individual. Okay. Now, usually that goes to a recruiter of HR of some sorts first, and then it goes to a hiring manager of some sorts second. So it, it has to be able to pass quote unquote, the test for those two entities. And part of that resume and showcasing your abilities to do the job and showcasing, yeah, we want to talk to this individual. Part of that can be certification. Okay. It's not necessarily a mandatory requirement, but the fact of the matter is certain certifications will stand out depending on, on your level in the industry, though they'll, they'll certainly stand out and they'll make HR or they'll make the hiring manager want to have the conversations with you. If you're on the offensive side of the house, you have a lot of industry recognized certifications out there. I mean, they're recognized because people have done them. That's ultimately why certifications are, are known. Certifications like CRTO, Certified Red Team Operator by Zero Point Security, which was built by uh, Rasta Mouse, Daniel Dugan, who's very well known in the Active Directory, like offensive security red team space. That's a pretty popular one. The OSCP, the Offensive Certified Security Professional, I don't know what the acronym stands for nowadays, but the OSCP has been pretty revered and looked at for a very long time, and it still is. TCM, TCM Security with the PNPT, they're up and coming. They're disrupting a little bit of the OSCP Offensive Security market. You also have some from the e-learning security, CRTP, 
that's just to name a few from the offensive security side. But ultimately, what you have to know is that they might be able to get you an interview, potentially, but it really comes down to what makes you different than everybody else applying. Because if there's a pen testing gig that you really want, and all 20 of you have the OSCP, then what, again, what's going to be that differentiating factor? And then sometimes the person without OSCP, but they have a blog and a really cool GitHub repository with some tools that may stand out more than the OSCP. So again, that, that's my way of saying, can certifications help? Yes. And they also be a mute point depending on where you apply to also. Yes. Okay. So there's a fine balance and it's hard to know the answer to depending on where you apply. But always, I tell folks, always lean on the side of knowledge. Okay, that's the most important thing. Because once you get that interview, if you don't know the job, if you can't help me as your employer move the ball forward, then you just won't get the job, regardless of whether you have one or 30 certifications. So always lean on the side of knowledge and then always lean on how can I showcase to an employer that I know that knowledge. That's why I'm such a big fan of blogging. GitHub repositories, and then showcasing your, your trajectory into security. Yeah, definitely, Alberto. Thanks, mate. And I think it's about a bit of a balance. Like I say, you wouldn't want to go all, all in on certs and have no experience whatsoever and, uh, and no kind of uh, online brand or digital presence and, uh, and vice versa. It's about just taking a, taking a nice balanced approach and, and a well-rounded approach. Thanks, Albert. I've still got a couple more questions for you, but I can see there's a there's, there's, um, couple of uh, listeners that, that want to ask questions. So I'm just going to, um, Foisel, I think you were first, uh, my friend. So I'm just going to pop you up to the up to the virtual stage. I'll just uh, flick that now. Joel, to the virtual stage. Joel, how you doing? Joel, you're just on mute as well. Yes, how you doing, my friend? You okay? I'm living the dream. How are you? Yeah, very well, thanks. Did you, did you have a question for Alberto? Absolutely. First, hi, Alberto, long time no see, personal friend of mine. Good question. Sorry to put you on the spot, but what is your opinion of the red team tools industry, such as Cobalt Strike and Brute Retail? Should red teams roll their own, use open source, or look to purchase much of their attack tools? And which is a better operational choice and which is a better business decision? <laughs> Joel, good to hear from you, man. Wow, what a question. That's a good one. I hate to go with the generic answer on this one, but then I'll give you some more flow. But the answer to that is depends on your company. Now, what are some of those factors people should consider? One, and I don't think it's, you know, unfair to say this, but one is you need to be able to, if you're going to go commercial on your offensive tooling, you need to be able to trust the company where it's being developed, the developers, the institution, and the country of origin. So that's the first thing I'll mention on offensive tooling. The second thing you brought up is rolling your own, right? Building your own malware, building your own command and control framework for, for those that are early on in their career. So th those things, I would say there's value in building your own because there are different use cases that you want zero to no fingerprint of your activities on the target infrastructure. So even though you can go commercial, let's say you go with Cobalt Strike, which is a, a very mature product that's been around longer than I've been alive, probably very mature product. There are still use cases where deploying your own sort of command and control infrastructure whether it's the agent side and sometimes even your own infrastructure and server side, there are use cases where that is valuable. Now, there's also a very important distinction with offensive tooling that I think decisions need to be made, which is government work versus commercial work. I think both of them are very different in the offensive aspect, and both of them require different decisions to be made. If I'm running, let's say hypothetical, if I'm running an APT on a specific nation state, I don't think running commercial product that maybe certain people have access to, again, goes back to my first comment, that certain people have access to is probably an adequate choice. So having a more custom hands-on the source code is most likely going to be a requirement for you. 
obviously on the commercial side, it's a little bit different, right? You can delegate some of that risk to the fact that industry uses certain platforms more and more. The last point I'll make to your question, Joel, and then we'll go to some other questions is there is value in purchasing capabilities from external third parties. The reality is the offensive security tooling industry or just building offensive security tools overall is a very expensive skill. Okay, so the expectation of you, let's say you have an internal red team or you work for X company or if you're consulting, et cetera, the expectations for you to build very expensive capabilities all the time at all times while you're delivering services and products and PMing, project managing, if you're a consultant, all those functions of your work role on top of offensive security development, having those requirements is very rough, as many people know. So hiring third-party help for that, I think it's justified, particularly in the commercial routes. Hopefully that answers some of your question. Thanks for the hard one. <laughs> Thanks for the question, Joel. Thank you, my friend. You. I believe Charles was next. I'll just get you up on the virtual stage. Charles, my friend. Charles, how you doing, mate? You okay? I think the mute's on the bottom right of the user. Inter yeah, how you doing, Charles? Yeah, that it is. Hey, <laughs> I'm doing all right. Um, I just wanted to... I saw Berto was going live with you, and I so like I had uh, sec plus with Berto actually. He's an excellent professor. My Ooh. question is, what do you think about using bug bounties as as experience for you know, for jobs? Yeah, yeah, great question. I probably should have mentioned it, but yeah, great to hear from you, Charles. Hope all is well, man. Yeah, bug bounties are, in my opinion, a great place and a great way to get started and to. Uh, gain experience. Now, I'll say that with a caveat. Initially, it's going to suck. Initially, you won't find anything. Initially, it'll just be rough. We've all been through it. It's okay. Now, with that said, you're going to gain experience in enumeration and understanding technologies, understanding attack surface, and then eventually you might get lucky and find a few bugs. Yeah, you won't get rich most likely, but you'll find experience, you'll find bugs. And if those bugs are publicly disclosed, you can even put those down on your resume and say, hey, I'm a new person, but I, I've done a little bit of grunt work so I can land this first job. I think bug bounties is a perfectly acceptable route to gain experience. Just a reminder, just make sure you stay legal, make sure you stay in scope. There's a lot of great resources out there, particularly Jay Haddix on Twitter. He's an amazing bug bounty hunter. Some really good stuff comes out of him. Uh, yeah great way to to gain that skill thanks for the question cool. charles awesome thank you thank you yep. charles cheers mate so richard i think you are next my friend let me just get you up richard how's it going you okay yes i'm doing fine i spoke up earlier because there's two things i want to cover one there's some sort of a linkedin bug with iphones and ipads so when you try to click on a fellow listener member the whole app completely just shuts down. I, I, I think they're working on that. Another question I, I wanted to say for people who are not as advanced security, secu advanced cybersecurity people as you two are, what I normally recommend to people is we get a good, I use Ava, A McAfee. I make sure that I have a VPN turned on. I go in and remove the track removal stuff. And then I, of course I keep it updated. And then I go into file threader and delete, recycle, bin, and temporary internet files, which most people are surprised there's even stuff in there. A am I correct on the second part of this? That's a good way to protect your system? Yes and no, Richard. So I like to go a little more living off the land type of side of the house. For anyone, anyone still listening, his question was, and, and comments were around that individual self-protection at your house, particularly when you start off and you have home computers and things of that nature. I'm personally a fan of actually hardening and securing the Windows operating system instead of rolling out like McAfee or AVAS or one of the other cheaper like antivirus alternatives. So I would challenge you, Richard, with go online and look for how to enable certain capabilities on Microsoft Defender by default. It, it doesn't come with all the belts and whistles that it actually has, believe it or not. 
And if you were to query that a little bit, you'll find that you can enable a lot more protections on Windows Defender, which is pretty, it, it's gotten a lot better throughout the years. I can think I'll say. And you yeah. think that's better than McAfee? I, I, I have another expert, the military guy. But the other thing I always do is create a recovery drive, a uh, USB drive, which is something that a lot of people don't do. But you think uh, that's actually more power than what McAfee has now? Yeah, I do. I, I, yeah, I think a hardened Windows operating system with enabled features such as app locker and removing some of the misconfigurations. If you Google, just do a quick Google for like Windows hardening script, GitHub, you're going to come across a whole bunch of resources. I do think that's better than rolling out something like McAfee. And because at, at that point, you're just a lot of it is signature based. But if you do some of the cyber hygiene with just Defender itself, I, I think you get a bigger bang for your buck and you actually learn a lot more as well. Yeah, I do. I'd probably have to get my military expert to have me through it over the phone or something. I, I try not sure, to get sure. too far into the 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 acting or cybersecurity stuff too deep because I figure I'm going to mess my, my computer up on other areas. But uh, thank you. Uh, so use the Microsoft thing and learn how to use it better. That's, that's an interesting. Uh, thank you, all of you, and God bless you both. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Richard. Okay, so I believe uh, Shakita was next. Just let me get Richard. There we go. Oh, Shakita's gone. Let me get Leslie up. Leslie, how are you doing? Hey, guys, how are you? Yeah, very well, thanks. You okay? I'm good, thanks. Good. I had a quick question about portfolios and just wondering how important or beneficial you guys think that they are and what would be, what should be included in them. You're talking about like a digital portfolio, right? Correct. Yeah, I think they're valuable. The UI obviously says a lot. That's like the first picking a nice, simplistic, minimalistic UI is probably important, but just having like having enough information in there that really showcases the capabilities and the knowledge that you have and you can slice that many different ways with the information that you put on. But then at the same time, I think also staying humble in, in what you put on as well is probably important. I, I like to look at portfolios, at least the times that I've done like interviews and sat on like hiring boards. If people have their portfolios, that's a great sort of resource for me to click on and browse all their links, understand their background, understand their capabilities. That allows me to draw my questions better. That allows me to skip some of the maybe preliminary knowledge because I can tell that they have certain knowledge. So I think overall building a digital portfolio, putting it out there with a custom domain of some sorts is certainly valuable. It can help you in the long run. Great. Thank you. Mm. Appreciate it. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks for your question, Leslie. So we'll just the end there, guys. I can just see we've got Jacob. We'll get you on the virtual stage, my friend. Jacob, how you doing? Thanks for the comment on the post earlier. Appreciate it. How you doing? How you doing? I'm, I'm doing well, Thomas. I hope you guys are all right. I had uh, two questions for Alberto. So earlier you had mentioned uh, folks should probably get into GRC. So my first question is, how often do you see folks transitioning from GRC to the technical side? Yeah, so that's a great question. I certainly do see it. I think it's just not as spoken about as people, as other sort of career pivots, if you will. But actually just two weeks ago, I had a personal friend who had been doing GRC for, I think, two years, and they just transitioned into being a, a SOC engineer. So I think those internal moves are definitely possible. They're definitely doable. Obviously, communicating with your management is important. And then not only are you doing GRC as a day-to-day -day role, but you have to also start exposing yourself and learning and transitioning to the other roles that you want to be a part of. So I think it's just another alternative of a pivot as IT is. And you just have to be vocal. You have to demand, not demand what you want, but just be vocal about what you want with your employer or a potential next employer. And I think most people are going to actually gravitate to hiring somebody with GRC experience, knowing that they have the technical experience to pivot into other places as well. Of course. And that piqued my interest because that's actually exactly what I'm trying to do. 
And uh, that almost answered my second question. But so number two is, do you think the folks with only or strictly GRC experience end up taking pay cuts when transitioning to the technical side? Not necessarily. It depends. It depends on where you are, what level you are in GRC, obviously. If you're a senior GRC analyst or you're handling GRC for a large organization and your expectations are to jump into a pen testing gig or a SOC analyst gig, there could be some money differences there. So I think if you make the pivot at the right time, you shouldn't take too bad of a hit. Awesome, man. I appreciate you answering my questions. That's it for me. Cool. Yeah, thank, thank you, you Jacob. Mate. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you, my friend. Thank you, my friend. Brilliant. That was great. Good little Q&A at the end. And Albert, thanks. Thanks for your time, mate. I, I promised I'd just keep you an hour and we're, um, we're, we're two minutes over. And um, no, really good there. Love that Q&A at the end. Thanks to the listeners. Biggest audience by a mile that I've ever had, Alberto. So uh, thanks for that as well, mate. You, you're making us both look good, mate. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. It was fun. Y'all have a good 2024, everyone. Good luck out there. Yeah. Wicked. Thanks. And thanks for attending. Cheers. Cheers, guys and girls. Thank you. Thank you.